Uh, thank you for attending. And um, we are the Gender Equality Coalition of Ontario. And we were started in 2019 with a grant from uh, Wage Canada through the Canadian Federation of University Women's Organizations. So, um, so we thank those both groups for giving us the opportunity to start a coalition and thank you all for, for coming tonight. So I just wanted to share that for a moment. I would like to begin with um, a land acknowledgement. So we acknowledge that this is the sacred land upon which we're privileged to live and work. And we recognize the deep connection and the long-standing relationship between Indigenous peoples and the land of Southwestern Ontario and of London. This land has supported human beings for at least the past 10,000 years. And this land is the traditional territory of the Anishinaabe, which includes the Ojibwe or the Chippewa Nation, the Haudenosaunee, uh, also known as the Iroquois, which includes the Oneida Nation, the Lenape, uh, also known as the Delaware, the Atawandaran, uh, also known as the Neutral, and the Wendat, also known as the Huron Peoples. The Gender Equality Coalition of Ontario continues to support the Indigenous people of Turtle Island and the call for the investigation into the heartbreaking, brutal brutalities of Indigenous children found at former residential schools in Canada. We commit to working towards our own learning and truth seeking, as well as that of our community. Our coalition is a diverse group that's of settlers, oh, that includes settlers, because we're not all settlers, um, and uh, it includes settlers. And we acknowledge that we will never truly understand the pain and the devastation suffered by the Indigenous community. We commit our hearts and our minds to not only open our eyes and ears to learn, but also to use our voice and actions to stand up as active allies and, to, and accomplices to fight for justice. And together, we commit to the work of truth and reconciliation. So I will now um, turn it over to um, sorry. <laughs> I'll now turn it over to Amanda Zavitz. And um, Amanda, can I just ask that if you want to introduce yourself? Sure thing. So Thank hi, you. everyone. Um, welcome. Thank you so, so much for attending this evening. I'm really excited to see all of you here. And I'm really excited for tonight's panel presentation. If you ask me to pick my four favorite politicians, um, the people we have on our panel tonight would be uh, those people in our area. So I'm really excited to be able to ask them some questions. Um, and to share those answers with you. So for those of you who don't know me, I am the chair of the Gender Equality Coalition and I'm also a professor of sociology and women's studies at Fanshawe College and at Western. And I've been teaching at both of those institutions for over 20 years. So um, really that's who I am. My husband and I live in St. Thomas. Um, so we are Karen's constituents and uh, we own a little diner in St. Thomas called Country Charm Cafe. So that's a little bit about me. Now I have the distinguished pleasure to introduce our panel presenters for this evening. I'm gonna begin with Lindsay Matheson, who is an MP. She is a representative of London Fanshawe. She was elected first in 2019. And Linda, or Lindsay currently serves as the deputy house leader and the critic for, for national defense. She previously served as a critic for women and gender equality and is currently the deputy critic in this portfolio. As the NDP's former critic for diversity, inclusion, and youth, and critic for post-secondary education, Lindsay stands up for people who are too often ignored by government decisions. So, Lindsay, thank you so much for agreeing to be part of our panel presentation tonight, and welcome. Um, next, I'd like to introduce Karen Vecchio, who is a representative of Elgin Middlesex. She's an MP. She has been elected since 2015, and she serves as a shadow minister for women and gender inequality, as well as youth. 
In addition to serving as numerous positions, Karen was the chair of the Conservative Social Development Caucus from 2016 to 2019, and the Conservatives Caucus liaison to the LGBTQ plus community and all, all party parliament group to end modern slavery and human trafficking. Karen was raised on a turkey and hog farm in Sparta, I never knew, and she remains connected to her rural roots in Southern Ontario. She's married to Mike Vecchio and they have five children. So again, thank you, Karen, and welcome, and thank you for coming. Um, next, I'm going to introduce Ariel Kayabaga, who is uh, MP of London West. She was elected first in 2020. Ariel serves as a member for Citizenship and Immigration, as well as the Official Languages Committee. She's the first Black woman elected to the London City Council. Ariel and her family left Burundi among a mid-civil war, and she experienced firsthand the challenges that newcomers face to our community. Ariel's experiences inspired her to become a vocal champion for other newcomers, and she's particularly focused on homelessness prevention, civic engagement, and inclusive communities. As a single mother and former city councillor and community activist, Ariel embodies the qualities of a new type of political leader, progressive, resilient, and optimistic. Thank you for being here, Ariel. And last but not least, we have Terence Kernahan. He is currently the, uh, he's an MPP and he represents London North. He has been elected since 2018. Terence serves as a critic, government services and consumer protection critic, um, LGBTQ plus plus with provincial parliament for London North Centre. He's passionate about social justice, healthcare, housing and education. And before politics, he was an elementary school teacher librarian. Welcome, Terrence. This is your second time coming to um, one of my sessions. So I really, really appreciate your time and thank you for coming again. So I'd like to begin by asking all of the panelists the same question. Um, I would like you to answer the question, what does gender justice mean to you? We begin all of our presentations this way and I think we will begin with Lindsay. Um, well, thank you so much. And um, I, I want to say how, how privileged I was um, as a member of parliament uh, in my first term. It, it, it doesn't seem that long ago since my first term. Um, but uh, to serve with, with Karen on the Status of Women Committee. And one of the things that we moved on very, very quickly was, of course, um, analyzing the impacts of COVID-19 on, on women. And those who identify as women. And uh, we had an excellent uh, overview which helped to and still helps uh, for I think uh, certainly as an opposition to really frame where we believe that the government needs to go and to provide that voice of, of recommendation and, and, and proposition not just opposition. Um, some of the things that we were really focused on and, and the division of that idea of of gender justice really took form in, in three ways for me. Um, it was women's physical safety, sorry, that's my partner working from home. <laughs> um, women's physical safety and security. Uh, women's health and caregiving roles uh, and how we take a major lead on that. And then women's economic security. Um, Within that physical safety side, of course, we saw and we know that just that before COVID and long after COVID, but certainly exacerbated by COVID, um, has been the devastating impacts of gender-based violence. Uh, that's including, you know, domestic violence, intimate partner violence, family violence, and, and human trafficking for the purposes of sexual exploitation. Um, and of course, that actually doesn't just happen during a pandemic. This, these, these things increase during every economic downturn. Uh, women and those who identify are often um, hit the hardest. And we know that, of course, uh, members of Indigenous communities, racialized communities, individuals where the, the intersections of, of poverty and, and disability and, and all kinds of things, they, they are even greater. Uh, uh, hit uh, by by any kind of um, issue in, in terms of the economy that way. Um, we saw, of course, um, uh, and and Jesse Rogers, who's an incredible advocate uh, here in London uh, for Inova, 
she she said it so well and i've heard her say it often that that uh you know home was determined to be the safest place during COVID-19 and yet for so many women who impact who are impacted by violence especially domestic violence the home was in fact not the safest and yet they were trapped there uh far more and then of course we saw um that all of those public measures uh those health measures that we were implementing and trying to put forward were were significantly impacting women um Shelters, of course, are have been consistently underfunded. Um, there were attempts, of course, by the government, gratefully so, to, to provide some supports. Um, however, uh, the pandemic has certainly impacted their ability to, to fundraise in the same way. This is true for all community organizations and all organizations that require that sort of level of funding. Um, and so one of the things that I was really uh, pushing hard for and will continue to push hard for is the idea of core and stable funding. And that's what I believe ultimately uh, a lot of the organizations women's organizations, domestic, or any sort of uh, gender-based violence organizations uh, need. It's that core stable funding. They do incredible things, but when it's project-based, when it's based on a program that a government thinks that they need to deliver upon, as opposed to what uh, the community sees directly in terms of the needs and responses to that community and they are unable to do so because they don't have that core and stable long-term funding that they can rely upon um, that significantly impacts their ability to to react uh, to something like a pandemic for example but anything really that they need to in terms of, of community need one of the things too that i want to push for in this regard is is domestic violence leave some uh, unions some co um, collective agreements uh, are starting to really recognize uh, domestic uh, paid domestic violence leave in terms of what uh, people um, in that predicament uh, need. Um, and of course, we need to talk about um, gender-based violence national action plans that take into account uh, Indigenous women and girls and the needs for per, uh, and provision of culturally appropriate services both on and off reserve. Uh, we need to think about how that relates to shelters, transitional homes, housing, affordable housing. Um, and and it's, it's, it's really quite upsetting for those of us in the, in the community, of course, who, who know that this is something that's been promised for over six years uh, by this government. It, it, it hasn't taken form. Um, it's been promised for that long and really needs action. Um, in addition, uh, of course, part of that is, is in a huge part of that is a national action plan um, uh, in terms of the, the implementation of the recommendations brought forward by um, the National Inquiry into Murdered and Missing Indigenous Women and Girls. And um, that has been promised for a very long time. Um, the report has been out for, I believe, over two years. And uh, there was some funding announced, about $300,000 announced uh, a few days ago, I believe last week in, in that regard. But the significant amount of... of uh, uh, action that's required on that hasn't happened and so that's something that we have to fight for in terms of when i think of that gender justice quickly and i know that i'm going on a, a lot but in terms of i, I do that karen knows uh terence knows too. um <laughs> ariel's new uh to me rambo um but women in terms of uh the the health and caregiving roles that they that they provide of course again women have been directly impacted by that if we think about long-term care we think about the care of our children those those fall upon women and we heard that repeatedly in our in our committee study um again it was it was uh, an issue before the pandemic it is a huge issue now um and and of course women take on and are responsible for a disproportionate amount of unpaid domestic labor. Um, and so we need to look at what that means. I think that we need to have a significant um, uh, idea of what unpaid labor truly means, how that impacts our economy, how that is, is taken for granted, has been for a very, very long time. We need to recognize that value of unpaid caregiving work uh, for spouses, for children, for grandchildren, for seniors as our, as our parents age significantly, um, and the supports that's required for that. Um, I 
I know that the government has started to move on on child care. Uh, this is this is far overdue. Uh, 28 years in the making. It's something that we continue to fight for. One of the things that I've put forward actually is um, a bill in the recognition of the need for legislation behind that. So not just the money coming forward, hopefully, uh, like in in short term, but longer term commitments, and to ensure that it's universal, to ensure that it's publicly funded, that it's publicly delivered, um, but that it's sought in legislation to ensure that that money has strings attached to it from the federal government and so that there are universal national standards for that as well. Um, and of course, a lot of work needs to be done. And I know Terrence uh, probably will discuss this in terms of the provincial side, but that long-term care standard and the national the national standards that are required for long-term care. And as we um, have seen, again, the pandemic brought this into huge light. And yet we've known that this is an issue for a long period of time. If we, my cousin is a PSW, she has been talking about this for years in terms of being overworked. Uh, it's mainly upon women, it's mainly upon migrant women or, or newcomers to Canada. And um, there are so many uh, issues within that, that uh, I, I won't get into right now, because again, super long. The last piece I wanted to talk about was uh, women's economic security. Um, and again, this comes into the fact that women lost their jobs at a far higher rate during the pandemic. Um, but we saw that because of that caregiving side, because of, of the schooling uh, and, and that, was, that was required and that fell upon women. So again, talking about that National Child Care Act, again, uh, and I'll put some stuff into the chat after I've, I've stopped talking for so long, uh, it just in terms of a reference to to my bill and, and others um, but but women have Im, have been impacted and experienced that poverty um, in, in far greater ways that men have and so I think that we need to when we talk about child care we talk about affordable housing as well we talk about um, affordable living and a guaranteed livable income. Uh, a colleague of mine, Lee Gazan, has put forward a, a, a private member's bill on this. This will be a huge focus for us and how we how we expect people to live. Um, when we talk about those who give that that, that give care to to family, um, again, that falls on women. And so, how is that not compensated? So, an annual or a guaranteed livable income certainly can can address that. Um, paid sick leave can address that, ensuring that there that 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 exists fairly. Uh, again, the government has me, has moved a bit on it, and yet not in all of the ways that that are necessary. Um, business owners that are that are women who have been so greatly impacted because they often provide uh, supports into our, our economy that are focused on women, or focused on healthcare, or focused on social supports, and so on. Um, I'm going. I'm going to stop there. Well, actually, no, I have to, I have to, sorry, I have to mention uh, the need for gender-based analysis in all government decisions. And that's how you achieve better gender-based um, decision-making or, or gender justice. Uh, you have to talk about the, the collection of disaggregated data um, as it impacts women as well, because you can only make good decisions based on that data that that's studied in that way. And of course, pay equity legislation, um, there has been some brought forward federally it, it was very, very slow timelines. I can go on a whole big rant about pay equity. Um, we do have this moving forward federally, but only in a federally regulated workplace. And um, I'm going to stop talking now. I'm sure that we'll continue to talk and I took a lot of time. Sorry. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you, Lindsay. So I don't know how anyone can add more things, um, but I'm sure we will. <laughs> So I can tell the discussion will be a little bit political and thank you for making the connection between um, gender justice and the economy. And I really like your last point about gender based analysis at the political level. So thank you for that. Um, I'm going to remind you that we we have four questions and four of you. So keep that in mind when you're answering. Um, and I'm going to move to Ariel next and ask you if you could if you could define gender justice from your perspective. Thank you. Um, I mean, I was thinking, sorry, just a second.
I apologize. I'm sharing a space with my son who's currently on an online um, cadet class. And I'm like, we, we can't have both computers going at the same time. So I can't hear myself. But um, hi, everyone. Happy New Year. Uh, thank you so much for having me on this platform. Um, I was just thinking, uh, Lindsay went on and I think she she introduced like about five different you know platforms and five different uh, conferences we can have on so many uh, discussions and so many things that uh, we could talk about, and I, I would love to have some time to dive into that, but um, I did make a little bit of notes of what I wanted to talk about today, and, um, you know, it's January, and um, we are getting close, we're near the end of January, we're getting close to um, uh, February, which is Black History Month, uh, so I'm not going to miss out an opportunity to talk about uh, Black women uh, and gender equity and what that means for uh, intersectional feminism, and that's you know, where my notes were, were related, but I do concur with a lot of the things that uh, we have experienced during the, co um, the pandemic, uh, the disproportionate ways that um, women have experienced um, COVID, uh, especially in uh, access, accessing um, supports when they're needing or fleeing uh, domestic violence. Uh, femicides across the country have gone up um, and there needs to be a lot more work than that. And uh, this is stuff that I'm, I'm sure Karen is going to be talking about the status of women. I'm not sure if Lindsay's on that committee as well. I'm not, but uh, we have been talking about it in our women caucus uh, at work that it, it's something that's really important. And uh, myself and other MPs, I'm sure, have talked to uh, Jesse Rogers, who um, it, it's always nice to hear when people say, we're growing, you know, we're growing our organization and things are going well, but in this field, it's not a good thing to hear. Uh, I would love to get to a place where they talk about not growing. They talk about having to uh, let go of um, their staff members because they don't have that many clients anymore, but that's not the case right now. And it's an unfortunate reality that uh, we've experienced uh, in the last um couple of years, but especially during the pandemic. Um, so the question, just going back to the question, which was, what does um, gender justice mean to you, to me? Um, when I was thinking about this question, I really thought about, um, you know, the work that um, Black women did and continue to do um, for a person like myself to be um, in an elected position today. Um, I mean, everything that Lindsay mentioned, we would not be having this discussion if there was gender equity or gender justice in the world. Uh, we wouldn't be having to talk about funding uh, women's spaces, uh, shelters for women, uh, preventing women violence uh, or gender-based violence. We would not have we would not have to have these discussions if we were in a place where gender equity or gender justice has been um, uh, achieved. Um, so I, I, I do want to starkly say that we're still so far away from that. And it's, it's disturbing. It's disturbing because we, um, we are probably more than half of the population and we are still struggling and there's still uh, a lot of barriers. Um, and I, and I, I really want to mention that those barriers come from the lack of uh, inclusiveness, um, making sure that there are voices um, that represent Black, uh, Indigenous, and people of color in these conversations who are often on the margins of, of, of everything is really important. I did pull up a quote from a woman that I admire. Uh, she says that all inequalities uh, is not created. Uh, so all inequality is not created equal. So we all experience inequalities in our lives, but it is not created equal. So the experiences of Black women versus of non-Black women is quite different from uh, everyone else. But I also want to bring up a number that really shocked me at the beginning of COVID. Um, the, the representation of Generation Z and millennial women in uh, workplace, uh, sorry, in, during COVID, uh, in the loss of jobs, was at 62%. And it was quite shocking to hear that younger women are experiencing a higher number and loss of jobs during COVID. Um, so as we talk about uh, how these inequalities are not created equal, you can only imagine what this means for uh, marginalized communities. Uh, I, I, for me, gender justice is, is something that feels like it's still really far. I've been reflecting lately on Martin Luther King and the work that he did 
uh, as we just finished celebrating his 93rd birthday, what would have been his 93rd birthday. And it really uh, stuck to me how many Black women were around him and fighting for, uh, you know, to end uh, segregation and to fight for Black women to be uh, in, 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 included in school systems, in workplaces. And yet, to this day, we're still fighting the exact same thing, you know, for the rights to vote. Uh, we're still fighting for the exact same thing. We're still fighting for, it, it feels like it keeps um, reproducing in each generation. Like I'm 31 years old, you know, getting a little older, but I, I'm wondering like uh, when Martin Luther King was, uh, you know, fighting his fight, that was over 50 years ago. And uh, and we're still we're still fighting for the same thing. We're still arguing the same argument. We're still, you know, a hundred years ago, women were fighting for the rights to 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 vote or to be included in in decision making. Uh, just recently, we celebrated a hundred years with women in parliament, and yet we're still such a small number of women in parliament. Um, so, gender justice to me is getting to a place where. Uh, we retire the same old history of having to fight to exist, having to fight to, to be. Um, that's the notes that I made. Um, I do. Uh, I, I would. I would love to dive into a lot of the things that Lindsay Lindsay mentioned around um, how COVID has disproportionately affected. Uh, uh, women and how we need to fund more, uh, how much more money we need to, to, to put into supporting um, the work uh, to support women. But I, I would hope that we, we get to a place where we talk about never having to, to fund any more shelters. You know, I'd love to get to a place where the reports are coming out that we don't need this ser these services anymore. So uh, what are those conversations that we should be having? And I think that if we keep in mind that inequalities are created unequally for every single person and we include um, all voices in the work that we do and we make sure that you know we really start from the bottom up and that is doing the work to support black and indigenous women and people of color uh, we can get to a place where we can talk about gender justice and I don't think we're there yet. Thanks Ariel. I really appreciate your comments, especially about um, starting from the bottom up and recognizing the great work of Martin Luther King and also uh, having not achieved inclusion and or gender justice. So thanks for those comments. Um, I'm gonna move next to Karen and ask, what does gender justice mean to you, Karen? Thanks very much. And thanks everybody for coming out today. This is wonderful to see so many participants participating in this uh, in this topic that's so important to the four of us. Um, you know, just working off of what, what both Lindsay and Ariel talked about, for me, gender justice is when, you know, there truly is no barriers, where there truly um, is the opportunity for full equality and full opportunity. That I believe really begins with the, um, you know, the ending of violence against women, because I, to me, that is one of the biggest things holding women back, you know, for a woman to be whole when you, that there's the violence that continues to go on, that opportunity for that person to be empowered is take, has been taken away from a perpetrator. So for me, um, the first thing that we have to do is build a, a foundation of, not, of a community and society with no violence against women where gender-based violence doesn't exist, you know, that there isn't that uh, infant, you know, you're not inferior because you're a woman in relationships, you're actually equal. And there's lots to do with, something's just happened out there, something just went off, but there's there's so much to do with that. So I look at how do we empower women? And, and I think that starts by ensuring that there is um, a system that works for women. You know, sometimes we look at the justice system, time, sometimes we look at the safety of women. Yes, I wish that we didn't need all of these shelters. I wish we didn't need that, but I think that there needs to be more done there to ensure that women are able to build that confidence and live a safe life as well. I, you know, I'm so fortunate to be, I'm the chair of the status of women for the 44th parliament once again, and the shadow minister for Gen, uh, women, gender equality and youth. And those are parts that right now, um, as Ariel talked about, when we're looking at COVID, the impact on women specifically, I speak a lot of times when I'm talking to people. Last week I had about 20, I had 27 meetings just on my shadow minister's role. And the thing that I'm hearing is, is so much, you know, um, parents um, for myself, I'm a middle-aged woman, meaning I have children and I have parents. And what I found this time as we're going through COVID, that group of people caught in that 
that's exactly where the caregivers, all of that stuff where you're trying to manage your children who are not in school and your parents that are aging. Uh, so I see a lot of inequality there. And although we work towards equality, it's not there if we don't have partners towards equality and that comes with men. And so, you know, I, I, I being the shadow minister for this and looking at some of the things, I think there's lots that we need to focus on. And some of the things to me comes to the violence against women starts with teen dating, starts with how do we empower young women to recognize what is right and what is wrong? Because I always fear the path that they may go down when they have a, a bad relate when they have a, a violent relationship, both either mentally or physically uh, with abuse. And so to me, it's not just about empowering women, but also educating young um, young men and boys on what is the appropriate ways to teach uh, to um, to work with women, to participate with women, and recognizing that they're equal. That comes at from the home as well, and that's something that's really important to me. I, I always say that if my mother-in-law was on this today, I would say to her, "Thank you, thank you for raising a boy and a son who believes in equal." women. Uh, that's something, you know, anyone who knows them, I know Lindsay and Terrence have seen Mike around all the time. We're partners, we're equal partners. And that is how women be, can come be successful. I'm fortunate because I have supports around me and I think everybody can be successful when they have those family supports around them. And especially as a woman, knowing that as a woman leaving my children, knowing that there are supports there to help as part of that family, because maternally, it's really difficult for me, but I have a whole village around me and that's important. And then I look at also the governments. We talk about what we can do and there are certain pieces of legislation that were put forward in 2014, talking about 30% of women on boards. Well, we still to this day have less than one third of women on any boards in our top 500 trading companies in Canada. That's really important to know that you know, um, there is nothing there. And unfortunately, the good legislation, but no teeth. So we need to make sure that we have stuff like that because women in governance makes a big difference, whether they're CAOs of companies, which I think sits at about three or 5% of all women or all uh, Canadian corporations in Canada are led by women, three to 5%, it's really, really low. What can we be doing better there? Because, you know, that is a lot to do with how this country runs as well, you know, from the, the way businesses and corporations run to the way that they market to families, you name it, it's a big part of it. So it's important to have both men and women at the table so that we can talk about Canadians, so that we can talk about what we need as a society. So to me, it's um, ending violence is, is key so that we have the empowerment and then we have that economic security for all Canadians, women, uh, men, everybody across the board. But right now women are falling behind. Um, I think COVID, COVID has exasperated that as well, has made it worse. Uh, for every step that we made forward, we did go back a few steps because of COVID. So this is where we need to really work together and ensure, as Lindsay said, the GBA lens needs to be applied. Gender-based analysis, when we're looking at federal programs, when we're looking at any programs, they need to be analyzed, whether it's gender, whether it's the rural remote divide or rural remote, and suburbia divide, whatever that may be, we need to ensure that we're always looking at that. Thanks very much. Thank you, Karen, for your comments. Um, thank you for recognizing sociologists, women's study professors, feminists are, have talked about the fact that we have moved backwards, that since COVID, um, we've actually maybe taken off decades in the movement towards equality. So that's an important point to recognize. And also thanks for talking about men because our gender equality coalition attempts to distinguish itself by including men as part of the solution. So um, with that said, I'd now like to move to Terrence and ask um, Terrence, what does gender justice mean to you? Well, I wanna thank everyone for joining us here this evening for an incredibly important and timely conversation. To me, gender justice is about fairness, it's about equity, it's about balance, but it's also about representation as uh, many of my, my previous uh, folks have said. It's not just about making space, but it's empowering others to take their space and recognizing diverse voices and intersectional identities. You know, we are really coming in to grips with many recurrent themes, well, perennial, uh, if you will, that, you know, gender justice should be about equal pay for equal work. Uh, it should be about broadening employment opportunities. It should be about universal publicly funded childcare. And I love the fact that uh, MP Matheson has said that it needs to be protected and with, some, with standards in place. We also need to make sure that there's adequate support for 
single mothers and sole support parents. We need to make sure that there's affordable housing so that people can have a safe place to call home, a safe place to build a foundation for a family. But also the mention of, of long-term care standards is an incredibly timely one. The fact that the army had to go in and rescue many of these folks and the fact that soldiers in our army are suffering PTSD from what they saw in our long-term care homes should make everyone pause because it's an indictment upon all of us and our society that we treat people who have less of a voice in that way, that we've allowed that to happen. Uh, you know, gender justice is also about healthcare access to, 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 for gender non-binary folks. Um, you know, amending new courses of study uh, at universities so that new doctors have an awareness and understanding because we don't know what we don't know. It's not that they don't necessarily care, it's just that they haven't been given that opportunity, they haven't been given that education. I also come back to our understanding of gender as a society. You know, unfortunately, you know, in, in the way in which we apprehend the world, we tend to think of gender as duality or binary opposition or one against the other, this sort of adversarial relationship. You know, I think we need to consider and interrogate that sort of understanding. You know, I, I'm always inspired and find it heartening that there are brave individuals who've transcended that binary, who have really uh, been true to themselves and lived and taken their space and don't conform to these arbitrary, socially determined uh, concepts of gender. You know, I think we also need to interrogate this concept of biological essentialism that all, you know, all women are such and such and all men are such and such, that there are some sort of inequalities that are attributed or ascribed to you based on your gender, because that just makes no sense. That uh, takes away individuality, it takes away personality, it takes away choice, quite frankly. And again, it's arbitrary, it's socially determined, it is a, a construct that is put upon people. You know, I also think that that sort of categorization or that categorical thinking is the one that is responsible for so many ills and isms in our society, whether it be you know, racism, sexism, homophobia, transphobia, those, it all springs from the same root. You know, as I, I think back to what the other presenters have said and extraordinarily well, that COVID has exacerbated many of the issues that were, uh, that were present within society and laid bare, you know, all of these different faults. And we, they cannot be ignored. The division of labor, you know, whether it's at home or at work or socially, you know, women supporting loved ones in long-term care institutions and holding up that entire uh, field, quite frankly, the, the, the caregivers who go into those homes because the PSWs are worked off their feet. You know, I worry about, you know, the future as it stands now. I worry about burnout. I worry about mental health. I worry about the wave, the oncoming wave of women who will be fleeing domestic violence, the ones who cannot flee right now because of our current situation. You know, it's, it's also shocking that we live in a society where gender is a social determinant of, is recognized as a determinant of health, and not in a biological way, but in a social, because of social constraints. That's frightening. That's something we really need to, to consider. We look at events that happened at Western University, uh, where, you know, all the students walked out in solidarity because of the culture that is present there. And I think the words that will always stick to me as having been a, a teacher who did bring in, uh, you know, the former Sexual Assault Center of London and ANOVA to speak uh, to grading classes about consent is that we need to teach rapists not to rape. It is about teaching our young men to have that respect, to understand what consent is, to not simply know the words, but know what the meaning of those words are. What does it look like? What does it sound like? And how do you know what consent is not? quite frankly. You know, I also consider our electoral systems, quite frankly, and that our first past the post, this antiquated, our anachronistic, archaic system is one that benefits uh, old rich white dudes. You know, I, I look forward to true progressiveness. I look forward to proportional representation where equity deserving. And I just want to put a pin in that because notice I didn't say equity seeking, where voices like that are heard and recognized and respected. Thanks, Terrence, for your comments. I really appreciate it. Raising so many good points, you sounded like a sociologist. 
Okay, so um, I can see that we're not going to have time for all four questions. So I'm going to combine the next two questions. Um, I want you to tell me um, what is the current state of gender inequality in Ontario politics from your own personal perspective? And in telling me that, I'd also like you to maybe add, have you experienced anything personally um, in terms of gender inequality from your own political position? So what is the current state and what, what have you experienced personally in Ontario politics? Um, and I think this time we will begin with Karen. Thanks very much. And, you know, that's a really good question. I, I'm going to start off personally with, you know, have I experienced things differently because I'm a woman versus a male in, in politics, I think is something that's really important to look at. And, you know, I think for women, um, we do in many, many cases, I think of I think of what's happened in the last two years where we've seen a, a little bit well, we've seen a lot more uncivilized behavior. And I think that because of that women, it's a, we've become a little bit more of a target. Um, so I think that is what something I've seen over the last couple of years is um, being targeted and and some people thinking that we're weaker because we're women. Bring it on. That's what I say. Bring it on. Um, I don't care if I'm a woman or a man. You just can't do that kind of stuff. And and sometimes I find that people, they will go down to that personal level of, of you know, being a woman or whatever. And it's just not, it's just not there. And, and for anyone who goes there, the conversation is pretty much over and a no brainer because that's not what we're disagreeing on or, or we're disagreeing on policies or, or things of that sort. I look at the, the last federal election and, you know, every political party had uh, approximately 35% or higher as candidates. But that is something that we have seen. And I know that we have talked about when we talked about um, women winning in, in elections. Uh, I look at my own party, we ran about 34% of women, and yet we have less than 20% sitting in the House of Commons. Um, you know, th those numbers are, are difficult. Uh, some of those numbers, you know, the block is very difficult to look at their numbers. They don't run across Canada. Uh, Lindsay's party has done very well. I think they're, they're sitting probably at about 46% of elected officials being um, being female, which is excellent. And we can continue to work to those things. Um, I believe that we need to ensure that we have proper training for everybody as well as candidates, because it's, it is a different uh, place out there as well. So we need to make sure that we have things available. As for politics in Ontario, um, you know, I, I, I think that um, everything right now has a spotlight on it, right? And so in Ontario, I think that it's probably, Terrence knows what it's like being in, in the Queen's Park area, but I look at the people that we have representing us in Queen's Park, and I look from our own group, and I think, wow, we are so fortunate. In London, and in, in, uh, in London, we have both at the provincial and at the federal level, six women. The men have, I mean, I just laugh because, sorry about Terrence and Jeff, we have six strong women representing at two levels of government, we're the majority. So it's interesting because I see that we've done really well here. I think others have to catch up. Thanks. Thanks, Karen. I'm going to actually move to Terrence next. Well, thank you, Dr. Zavitz. Um, you know, I guess... I also make my comments, uh, I must tell you that, you know, as a, a white cisgendered male, but also a member of the, the 2SLGBTQIA plus community, um, I'm also really proud that in 2018, I was elected alongside a caucus that is 50% female. And so, you know, I was really thrilled that, you know, we really put, put our money where our mouth is, you know, and making sure that women are, all, are not just running, but they're running in spots where they can win, not just simply as an afterthought, you know. I think we've come a long way, but I think equity is, is a moving target and the goalposts frequently uh, become change, become changed. Like back in 1990, there was the Pay Equity Act and the Pay Equity Commission, and those were wonderful progressive pieces of legislation, but they were cut and they were underfunded and they were disregarded. Like had those things been in place now, we should have narrowed that gap. There should be equal pay for equal work. It's ridiculous. It's unfair. You know, the knee-jerk reaction should be that everybody should stand up and say, no, why would you not pay men and women equally? Um, you know, I, I also think personally during the throne speech in 2018, uh, I'll never forget that the, the current government and laying out the priorities uh, started number one with their land recognition, which was bizarre in our day and age. But in the list of pillars of diversity, you know, where they include race, gender, ethnicity, they also included a word that sent shivers up my spine, and I'll never forget it to this day. They said the word 
lifestyle. So for any of you who don't know, that is a dog whistle uh, to indicate uh, to people who believe that being gay is a choice, that there's some sort of option and you've made a mistake and oh, shame on you and you deserve what you get. That was, it was frightening. Uh, you know, and just on that topic, uh, I'll never forget as well when I was a newly minted candidate, uh, when I'd come up against three amazing contenders uh, to, to be the NDP candidate in London North Centre. The first question that was asked of me by the media was, is London ready to accept an openly gay MPP? And, you know, it's, it's hard to gather, to, to gain, to figure out what the impetus is behind that question because you can't really jump inside someone's head. You can look at it in a positive way, maybe just simple curiosity, but you can also look at it in a very negative way. But, you know, London has proven it's a fantastic, caring, progressive city. But also, you know, I think the election results prove, prove that or bear that out. I also hope that in terms of representation, that kids who struggle uh, with their identity and fear that nobody will ever accept them or, or take them seriously, we'll see, we'll see that they can do anything, that they can accomplish whatever they set their minds to, and that when they do, and when they set their minds to something, that a kind, caring community will be there to support them. For me, representation is incredibly important. Thanks, Terrence, both for your comments and for your willingness to make um, the personal political. Thank you. Um, I'd like to now move to Ariel, who has informed me that she does have to leave a little bit early. So I'm going to allow her to answer this question and um, make some closing remarks. Um, thank you so much for uh, this question, Dr. Uh, Savitz. Um, again, I made some notes based on how I interpreted these questions. Um, and when I look at the state of Ontario, uh, in terms of uh, gender equity or gender justice, I think about all the cuts that have been made in Ontario and that have significantly impacted women, uh, impacted mothers. Uh, and, you know, and I think Terrence mentioned the long-term care, uh, how that impacts uh, senior women um, and women who care for them and uh, nurses who are in those um, um, working environments. Uh, when we look at the numbers of COVID, where we had the highest numbers of COVID, uh, it was truly around in the long-term care um, sector, affecting women, affecting seniors. We have had the highest numbers of seniors die in this pandemic. Um, and if you look at, you know, you go into demographics of those women who were affected by COVID, um, you can also look at Toronto, where uh, the highest number of uh, COVID-affected um, care providers were Black women, that were Filipino women, uh, basically women of color. Um, and, and, and when we go back to see where the funding was cut right before COVID, it is quite um, the display of what gender equity or uh, gender-based uh, violence it, it looks like in Ontario right now. When we look at how Ontario has dealt with the school system uh, and the school announcement during COVID, and um, when we even look at the mental health state of teachers, um, parents, as a mom myself, I have taken this on very personally. Uh, it, it has been very unbalancing to keep up and down and, and try to keep your child off of on, on, online so they don't find out the, the latest announcement before you have some time to, to gracefully let them know what's going on with their school system. But think about the teachers who were spent a year um, protesting to get better uh, classrooms, to have better supports in terms of funding in Ontario, uh, many of whom were also women and had to go into the pandemic with this already uh, sort of unshaken ground, like shaken ground, and then went into the pandemic and experienced the pandemic uh, in a very um, tough way in Ontario. Uh, it really shows me um, what is going on in terms of um, uh, gender-based um, equity or violence, because it is violence when you cut services that affect women, uh, knowing that we already have to scrape to get these services. Um, the funding cuts that were made towards the Ontario College midwives uh, was also a huge attack on women um, for the midwives that 
provide the service, but also for women who want alternative uh, supports to be able to give uh, birth to their children. Um, you know, there are a lot of women nowadays who want to choose to not have children in the hospitals for a lot of reasons, whether it be religious, whether it be uh, tradition, whether it be cultural. Uh, there's a lot of women who want to have that service and Ontario has cut funding towards the Ontario College of Midwives, which um, affects uh, women. Um, there's so many things that I had made a list on on how uh, women have been affected uh, by Ontario and what, the, you know, the state of Ontario, when you really want to, I think somebody should do a case study on um, gender in Ontario right now, because it is, it, it, we will, we will find that the last three to four years have been uh, horrendous on women with um, the current uh, ways that we're dealing with our, uh, our cuts and the funding cuts that have happened and, and whatever affects children affects women. Uh, the repeal on, on uh, the wage, uh, the $15 an hour that happened, um, the lack of appropriate support for uh, first, um, uh, first responders and um, our frontline workers, people who are working in grocery stores, uh, you know, and again, I, you know, when we look at class and social and we, we really find that there's a lot of women who find themselves in those positions. And if we push farther into the demographics, we're going to find that there's a lot of women of color, of Black and Indigenous, of those groups who are being uh, uh, disproportionately affected by um, these cuts that Ontario is making. So that was my lens uh, on answering this question. I thought uh, if we look at uh, the general view and the general uh, picture of Ontario and, and its gender justice, uh, it, it should be a case to be studied because uh, as we know that history serves us to remember a lot of things, we will remember the state in which women were in in Ontario between 2018 and 2022. Um, so in terms of my personal experience uh, as a woman uh, in, in, in my political life, um, I feel like if I started talking about it, we'd be here all night. Uh, I'm not going to go into the details of it, but I just want to mention that I was the first Black woman to be elected on city council. I am a young woman. Um, I was under 30 years old when I was elected. So facing that those two barriers of being a young person, um, not coming from a, a strong you know, uh, financial status and, and being a Black woman, um, you can only imagine what those experiences are. If you really want to know, you can Google me and you'll see many times where I've had to face uh, violence from people because of uh, my age and because of, um, I remember actually when I had a stalker uh, in 2020 and um, I've never really talked about this, this situation, but one of the things that my stalker often prefaced our conversation with was always that he knows I'm a single woman. So um, being a single woman, being a single mom was something that targeted me to be uh, his, um, uh, his target for an amount of, uh, I think it was about eight months that he called me consecutively and consistently to, 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 to scare me and to, to try and tell me to get out of politics. Um, and uh, as you see, I, I, I'm still not out, but it doesn't mean that it didn't affect me. It, it created a lot of other uh, ripple effect uh, things that happened to me. And, and I'm still you know, having a hard time picking up unknown numbers just because he would call from all these unknown numbers. So these are things that we experience as women. And, and, I, and I think uh, Karen said that it has gotten worse uh, in over the last uh, couple of years because of social media. Um, but I would also say that um, for women of color, for LGBTQ plus communities, for uh, trans women, um, for Indigenous women, and for Black women, it has always been very violent. I also just want to say thank you so much for having me on this platform. I really appreciate uh, being amongst uh, my colleagues who are uh, stellar human beings and doing great work in our community. Um, hopefully, we'll have some other chance to continue this conversation. I do have to get back to my uh, mom duties tonight. Thank you, Ariel, for coming. I really appreciate you being here. I hope to connect with you in the future. And I'm really sorry to hear about what you've experienced um, being a public servant. That's unfortunate. So thanks again for coming. I hope to see you soon. So um, I know that Ariel's conversation was moving a little bit into the political realm and it's not beyond me, Karen, that she was um, taking some stabs <laughs> at your party before she chose to leave. But I promise I will let you um, 
have another chance to speak again before we get off the call, but I will like to um, allow Lindsay the chance to answer the question, which is um, how, what is the, the connection be for you in terms of your position in politics and your personal experience with gender in, in politics? Uh, thanks uh, for that, and and uh, I want to thank all the the folks uh, in this panel. They they bring up incredible points, and um, I think it's it's a little it's a little different for me in some ways, having grown up for so long in politics. Um, I am incredibly grateful, and I cannot say how in 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 enough superlative words uh, to uh, incredible role models like my mother. Um, we just this week, we lost uh, Alexa McDonough in the party. And um, she's actually one of the first memories I have uh, as uh, a leader who came uh, to our house. She's she's very much like my mom um, in that they, uh, I can remember them sitting around the table uh, drinking tea and, and just, you know, talking about uh, all of the things that that were, were coming forward and, and Alexa um, was just so genuine. Um, she and I and I reflect on both of those women and how they taught me how to be uh, or the person, the kind of politician, the kind of representative that I wanted to be in terms of taking care of other people. But again, we get into a caretaker role as, as women, I think. Um, in terms of has it gotten worse? Yeah. Um, there's, there's no, there's no way to, to, to paint that any other way it has. Uh, social media, as Ariel had said, uh, has played a huge role in that. And there are no consequences. And I think um, the pandemic, again, I come back to that. It's, it's also, um, it's, it's played a role in that, in that we are more distanced we are virtual. Uh, we're not face to face. We don't have to live up to some of the consequences of of our of our words and our speech, and and that has huge impact. Um, I'm very very fortunate, and I have to say how incredibly grateful I am to the team that I have that surrounds me. Uh, they, in in addition to being like family and my own family, and and all the supports that I draw from. Um, uh, the, the community around me and incredible colleagues like Terrence and Karen, um, they protect me in a lot of ways. I don't, I, I had to take myself, myself off, faith, off Facebook. Um, I, I, I sort of, I, I check out Twitter every once in a while. I don't go down the rabbit hole. I, I, I don't do that. Uh, some of my colleagues have and, and you see the consequences. Um, but they they protect me they provide a bit of a barrier for that but i've also worked for members of parliament both men and women and never in the days that i worked for a man did they ever comment on what he was wearing that day or how he looked or that his hair was styled a particular way or what have you never was he offered um uh, marriage proposals um now you know, I'm, I'm maybe it's, it's, it's ungrateful of me because I, I have, but I've never taken anybody up on it. Um, but there's also, uh, I, I know, and in, in terms of those personal, it's, it's not as significant as, as Ariel's, but um, it's the comments that, that, that chip away at you. Um, and I still get mad about it. Um, uh, I, I went into a, a, an elevator one day at work and I was exhausted. And I just, I, I had this sigh of like, oh, you know, getting into the elevator. Okay, I'm going to go on to my next thing. And um, and the man uh, in the elevator said, oh, well, it either has to do with your boyfriend or your shoes. I don't know, actually, it had to do with work. So thanks. Uh, we were dealing with NAFTA. At, at the time. So we had to deal with like the biggest trade uh, deal that, uh, that the government was facing at the time. Funny. Um, I've been talked down to very often. I've been told directly, I don't know what I'm talking about when in fact I do. It may just be a different perspective. Uh, whether that has to do with the party or partisanship, I think it also has a lot to do with the fact that, that I'm not as young as Ariel, but I am a younger woman in politics and, and a woman. Um, all that said, I, I come back to, uh, in, in terms of the, the policy decisions that have been made, uh, and I, and I want to uh, reemphasize uh, one of the points that we had studied uh, in, in my time at on Status of Women was the impact of midwives and the incredible role that they can provide. But it was a reminder to me about choice and about how, and I look at this more from a federal perspective because I'm federal, but in terms of that Canada Health Act and the the inequity, uh, the inequality that women face across this country in terms of that choice. Um, 
and I think about all the, cho- the the changes that I continue to try and fight for, that my mother fought for, that Alexa McDonough fought for, for pharmacare, for free access to birth control, um, and and so many other uh, issues that, that, again, I won't talk about because I, I, I talked a, a really long time that first part. So I'll, I'll end it there, but but I don't think it's getting better. I think that, that there's a huge amount of room that's needed um, in terms of the political stage. We are a third of the House of Commons um that's and and at this day and age in, in 2022 that's not acceptable um but it does require parties and i'm, I'm very proud of the des- the decisions that my party has made to ensure that people from all gender or, or all equity seeking groups uh and that's key too um uh are provided with those equal opportunities that terence was talking about not just to run in a in a writing that we don't have chance in but to actually provide them with the opportunity to get to those assemblies and to make those different choices and to create those different laws uh, that we so desperately need. Thanks, Lindsay, for your comments. Much appreciated. Um, I'm hoping that maybe what we could do is cut the last question a little bit by being really specific. So I I asked in general what could be done to solve some of the issues related to gender inequality in politics, but I'm wondering if each one of you could pick maybe the top thing. So what one thing do you think could be done, or maybe two things do you think could be done to, um, you know, looking forward to the future in terms of moving forward in in in, a, in the possibility or in the realm of creating a society that is more that has more gender equality what could we do in politics to have a society that is more equal in terms of gender what one thing and i'm hoping maybe we could cap the discussion at around 8 15 um, so that we could allow for some questions from the audience does that sound okay okay so um maybe i will have um Terence, answer first. Um, what do you, what two, one or two things do you think we could do in the future to solve gender equality at, from a political perspective? Well, you know, just something that was touched on earlier was political reform and abolishing the first past the post system, making sure there's proportional representation and that there, there are more equity voices at the table. It's a matter of taking space, but also making space, you know, people leveraging their privilege, because everyone has privilege to a certain degree or one another. People should be reaching back and making sure to bring other voices forward. You know, I also think that um, just sort of on a, on a macro level, that we need to be better to one another uh, by listening to one another, by trying to put ourselves in other people's shoes. Um, I know it's impossible to do that completely, but by that activity, that trying to do it, You know, listening to somebody with an open heart, uh, listening to their story, you know, we might understand where they're coming from. It makes us better people. We might even learn something about ourselves by allowing someone to to share their story with us. I think as well, when it comes to confronting, like we have to call out all forms of of hatred and intolerance and bigotry when we see them. But I think we also need to do it in a way that is is done with love because we want to lead to that positive change so when someone says something that's ignorant and negative you know we don't want to go up against them in a violent way because they'll respond in a violent way back so what we need to do is you know try to get them on side and say you know when you say this is this what you meant like you know help me understand your thinking so we don't want to fuel the fires of hatred we want to help extinguish them with knowledge and understanding and love so uh you know i think uh there are many different political changes that need to be made, um, whether it's, you know, child care, respecting women's roles, uh, making sure that there are, you know, pink collar ghettos, as it were. And I just wanted to give a shout out, while well, I have the chance, uh, to Lindsay's wonderful mother, Irene, who abolished the pink tax on uh, women's hygiene products. So, the necessity. Thanks, Terrence. Um, I love the idea of connecting micro and macro. So responding with love and intention with a hope of moving things at a societal level. Um, And thanks for the shout out to Lindsay's mom. And we'll now move to uh, Lindsay. Sorry, that mute button. yeah, it's it's the shoulders upon the giant or the, the, the shoulders of the giants upon which we stand. Uh, and my mother, I, I am so, so grateful that she is one of them. Um limiting me to, to a couple like one point or two. Oh, but um I think at the base of all of it for me is income inequality. 
that unfairness, that that huge divide between those who have everything and those who have nothing, and everybody in between, uh, and that that growing that growing divide that we see. Um, I think that as we struggle more and more with that growing divide of of those who are struggling to make ends meet in every way, shape, or form. Um, uh, you're going to see more anger about that, and in that anger comes a lot of that division, right? That that and and the lack of patience uh, that Terence was talking about having, which we do need to have. Um, which is why, as a New Democrat, you know, I believe so 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 much in in the power of social programs and the delivery of those in an equitable way through government. Um, the insurance that that those who have the most in this society pay their fair share, uh, so that we can provide those, uh, so that we do create that equality. Um, and and just to to sort of touch on it in terms of politics itself and the creation of equity, you take the money out of politics that's how you create that equality because ultimately um, a, a single mom uh, who who wants to run and who wants to contribute in that way um, if if she's staring down the the, the financial res- the re- responsibilities or requirements uh, of a campaign then it's 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 so so much more difficult um, to try and convince her to run and she's the perfect candidate who needs to contribute Right or or any person from any of those intersectional um, groups, those uh, equity seeking groups that we talk about. So, um, money, money is the root of all. <laughs> Thanks, Lindsay, so much. Um, I like how you talk about equal access to power and resources. My students will know that this echoes our discussions of flattening the social stratification hierarchy. Um, so these are really great points. And now we're going to move to Karen. Thanks very much. And, you know, really building off of what Lindsay was saying, um, you know, I I look at the inequality when women are running. And I think a lot of it has to go back to some of our social circles and things like that. You know, uh, they've said that, you know, asking a woman to run, you have to ask her 11 times. That comes with confidence. But that also comes with the lack of resources and knowledge that are available to people about becoming political candidates. Um, I had a young woman call me last week and and I understand she wants to get into politics, but how do you jump into politics? So mentorship is huge on that. You need to have mentorship, people that are already in the game that are sitting there and willing to embrace all opportunities that way. I was very fortunate to have a a mentor like Lindsay, but mine was my former boss who's a male and they have to, everybody has to be willing there to, to take that next step and move forward. I think of programs like Equal Voice, it's a wonderful program that they have available for, for women who want to get in politics. One of the biggest things I see a problem with it is, you know, for instance, they do women in the house once every two years, 338 women from across Canada get to go into the House of Commons. Well, that's a great program, but it's, it's you know, it's very small. And, and where are the chapters? We don't have them in, in our smaller communities. So trying to get women into these things when there's not a course on how to become a politician, there's definitely not a course on how to become a member, a member of parliament um, and what to do as a parlamentarian or a legislative assistant or a legislature uh, uh, in the legislature. And I think for uh, for women, a lot of times, um, because it's risk, you know, you're going into something, you have children to worry about, you have this, there's not a guidebook. So I think a lot of times that mentorship, that education side on how to run, uh, Lindsay, how to finance a campaign, you know, those are great difficulties and, and very, very difficult as well. So I think the, um, the openness of how to get into the political world needs to be there as well. We do keep it in our small circles. I think that's very, very common. People don't feel comfortable. They call me, but I don't know how comfortable people feel about talking about politics, because I think a lot of times they question, should I really become, should I really do this? And I think that confidence sometimes leaves people from joining the political political world and, and we should be more open to that, more open to diversity and equity, 100%. I, I really agree with you, Karen. I mean, I think for, even from an own, my own individualistic perspective, I've thought about moving into politics, but it's a scary thought for all the reasons that we've talked about here tonight. And um, you know, maybe it's because I haven't been asked those 11 times, but um, it feels very intimidating for someone who hasn't operated within that political sphere. So thanks for all those comments. I really appreciate it.